Good morning, and more people may come in, but we are here, and it's so special to be here. It's incredibly moving for me to be in this room with all of you. I'm Jackie Terraza. I'm the Carolyn Muzzy Director of the Colby College Museum of Art. And <laughs> And it's my pleasure and my honor to be with all of you, and especially with the person to my left, Mr. Thaddeus Mosley. <laughs> Place matters, and I want to acknowledge that we are coming from many different places, and we find ourselves here in the homelands of the Wabanaki people. And uh, the Wabanaki Confederacy is Perfect. <laughs> I don't even know what it is. You remind me to ask everybody to silence your phones. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I got it. There it is. I think I got it. <laughs> you see, I, very few of you have one of these. <laughs> <laughs> so we are in the homelands of the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Maliseet, the Mi'kmaq, the Passamaquoddy, and the Penobscot people. And I want to honor them, uh, the people in these communities, for stewarding these lands and uh, sustaining their culture in spite of tremendous odds. And acknowledge our commitment to continue to repair and to build better futures together. Place Matters here in Waterville. Um, it's the place where the Colby Museum has really established itself and grown to become what it is today. And has uh, Waterville and Maine have always been important to this museum. And I want to acknowledge that as well. Since our founding in 1959, several things have been ongoing in terms of our strengths. One of them is the emphasis on American art within a global context. Another one is the incredible involvement and support of a philanthropic and, and civic community here um, in Maine and in Waterville in particular, um, who have joined to ensure that there is access to art in central Maine for a much broader audience and that it is art of the best of the best. Um, and also to ensure that the mission of Colby College that is um, so foundational to who we are as a museum, um, that the museum itself is important to that mission. I think the advocacy and support of scholars and artists have been crucial, and that is actually what allows us to be here today with Mr. Stadius Mosley. It was Alex Katz who gave us a gift of artwork by Mr. Mosley, and there we go this sculpture, a gift in 2020, soon after he saw um, an exhibition of his work at Karma Gallery in New York, and uh, proceeded to, uh, to acquire a number of works that then um, Alex Katz donated to a number of institutions around the country, including uh, the Colby College Museum of Art. And so um, Alex has really helped build the museum in countless ways, and I acknowledge he, he will be here today. Um, perhaps shortly. I want to thank um, the, Mr. Mosley for being here, and I want to begin by just offering a very brief sketch of his biography before we turn to conversation, just to provide a background for those of you who are not familiar um, with, um, with that biography. So I'm just gonna do, uh, of your very rich life, I'm gonna do that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you were born in 1926 in Newcastle, Western Pennsylvania. You were the son of a coal miner and a mother who sought for herself and for all of you a broader world. And um, you served in the military during World War II and after coming back from the military, you studied uh, journalism and English at the University of Pittsburgh during the 40s. Uh, you were quite successfully, in fact, as a writer and a journalist but, but, but then you change paths. Um, and a love of Danish design, a friendship with an artist, a friend, and visits to the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh 
but you mo moved you in a different direction. And so for six decades, he has made sculpture inspired by the art he sees, the music you listen to, your friendships. And you have also created uh, vehicles to enable other black artists and other artists of all backgrounds, really, to show their work when nobody else was paying attention. Supported, started supporters started collecting your work early, um, but eventually your sculptures were featured in several exhibitions and made it into public collections, though not as widely as I think they should have. A major moment came in 2018 when your work was featured at the Carnegie International and then soon after was that exhibition at Karma Gallery in New York. And that's, again, what brings, you, what brings us here today. So with that, I want to begin by looking at this incredible sculpture that I hope every one of you um, sees in the flesh in the museum today before you leave today. And this sculpture is called uh, Directional. And I'm wondering if you can tell us what you were seeking to explore or to discover as you were making this artwork. Well, I guess I should start with, uh, I guess my philosophy, my point of view in sculpture is the is spatial, weight and space. And that, of course, I, everything I hope has a vitality of maybe a feeling of levitation. When you look at something, it should look like it, it has movement. It, 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 and uh, a lot of people say, well, it looks like it's going to fall. Well, I try to make sure <laughs> that doesn't happen. Uh, but because I've been uh, able to balance work and, and to make sure that I have a solid base. On this particular piece, it, it's called directional, not named for anyone, but for the idea of the sculpture. And that means that you should view this as any three-dimensional work in all, on all sides. Of course, it, you know, unless we have real space, a lot of times that cannot happen, even in a gallery. But, um, but also, You'll see, uh, I have to tell you, my influences are African travel art, Brancusi, and Noguchi, and plus other things that sneak in that I see places, and there are people like Chiyita from Spain who's worked a, lot, a great deal. There's people that I admire tremendously, like Richard Hunt, who I know as a pal, but um, I, I recently uh, had 15 students, MFAs from Carnegie Mellon, in my studio. And then I went over and did critiques there, and they're thinking about what they're going to do next month, because they're graduating already. And I asked them how many people knew of Richard Hunt. Only one out of the 15 knew. And I was terribly surprised and disappointed because I think here's a man who has made his livelihood doing sculpture. And I think that would, would be the path I would follow if, if I were a young person coming out. But this particular sculpture, you'll see motifs of African tribal art. It may not look that way or not supposed to because this is about the essence of, of, of all these different influences. And you'll see some examples um, of these artists that he's mentioned a little bit later. I'm wondering if you can kind of bring us to the, kind of unpack the process of how you make these works, because people are fascinated by the fact that these are sculpted um, out of walnut, not an easy material to work from, and I'm wondering where you begin. Well, I mainly began, I have a stack of logs, I don't know, in see. my studio. There you go. Yeah, there we go, okay. <laughs> that looks like me at work, and I haven't changed. In fact, it looks like I haven't changed clothes, but I did. <laughs> Uh, but this this is what I do. I buy logs. The chalk marks you see on there was I was demonstrating to the students how I start. 
and, and how I des decide to make curves and whatnot. And I have, you see in the background, on, uh, to my left is a sculpture I'm working right on. I'm now on the piece on, the, uh, on, on my uh, trestle of my work bench like. That is going to notch inside of that log. Now all this, you know, is costs a little labor, <laughs> and um, and being that I'm the only one employed at this business, uh, it 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 takes a little time, and I'm not as young and as fast as I used to be, but but I think I think a little better in my old age, but the idea is that if you're going to you're dealing with a circle at all times. That's one thing you have to be. Uh, 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 you have to know that you have to deal with this circle. Now, how you change it? You slice it different ways, like an apple or orange, or you make it, or you make it a plane. You can plane it. Or you, a lot of people use just use planes and laminate them and start from there. Uh, so like people like Wendell Castle. But when I start, I was demonstrating how I started to make a circle. Then at the top, there is another chalk mark that demonstrates or will go the width, how it's going to go. Now I take a chainsaw, and right where you see those marks, I cut around. And and also, I take a chainsaw and I slice. But on the inside, all those are notched with carving tools. I have a great deal. There you see my hand tools, which I have many, because a lot of times, years ago, when I used to teach and demonstrate, I would go places, and they didn't have any tools. Even the students didn't. I did a workshop years ago in Memphis College of Art. And they didn't have any tools. I didn't take tools on the plane. So I ended up going to a hardware store and getting carpenter's chisels. <laughs> and of course, they thought I was a magician because nowadays, nothing is done by hand in art departments. You know, I um, was in Spoleto Festival years ago. 2000, everything goes so fast, 20 some years ago. And Richard Stella, Frank, I mean, Frank Stella was the artist, and he made the main speech at night. And people were asking him the difference of him coming up. And now he said, Well, it's hard to find an artist with dirty hands right now. <laughs> so, so, but anyhow, you keep in mind the past pictures, and you will see some of the ideas that came to fruition. Uh, I don't, um, years ago, I used to go over Carnegie Mellon twice a year and do demonstrations and whatnot. So, uh, uh, Doug Perping was the dean of sculpture at that time, and he would say, well, we have Mr. Mosley here today, and the reason I, well, I have him here today is because you know how I'm always telling you how important it is to do models and how important it is to draw all these things out? He said, the reason why I'm here, he doesn't do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to show you how he, he does it. And so uh, the gentleman, the president of the school here was telling me when I met him not long ago that he doesn't have talent and he couldn't do this. So I said, oh yeah. I says, like I have a dear friend in Montauk was an art teacher and a great artist. He says, like, which I agree, everyone has talent. Talent is more plentiful than air. And, uh, but you have to want to do this. I mean, like, uh, this is not no pain, no strain, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and people that have taken my classes, uh, they know 
that it's work. And, but I always say, uh, one of the proudest things I'm proudest of is that I never had, had a student, no matter how new, who didn't make a sculpture. And that's in 30 years I taught Don Touchstone and, and places like that. So you, you can do it, but fortunately, you have better things to do. I mean, why hack around <laughs> on wood all day, you know? <laughs> Well, and um, you touched, uh, you talked about the handmade, which is so important. And these, this is a beautiful sculpture and an example of the surface treatment of some of your sculptures. The other thing that is um, so important in your work is the role of music. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. This was uh, when I visited you, you, have, you showed me this um, decommissioned piano. And, uh, and then this is it's a wall um, on, on his, one of his walls full of, among other things, some jazz posters. And I'm just wondering about the role, if you can talk about the role of um, musical, music and music improvisation in your work. Well, I think all the arts are sort of similar and combine and run into each other one way or the other. And from music to dance, if you look at sculpture, one of, the features of my sculpture, I always say, does it dance? How's it move in space? And so you look at dancers and you, and you get a sculptural feel of them. And, uh, but for music, for me, I play music pretty much to, I usually out hammer the sound, but I, I play uh, music every day and may I have, my musical tastes are very narrow. I'm a great jazz connoisseur. I've been listening to jazz since I, I was eight years old. That's 1934. So that's been a space. But I've seen and heard many musicians. There's hardly anyone great that I haven't seen and heard in person. I'll say when Coltrane was in Pittsburgh, for two weeks, I saw him 12 times. So <laughs> That's amazing. That, that, that'll give you an idea and <laughs> of, of my dedication to music, you know. So, uh, but, but, but I think it's very important. And uh, I remember back uh, when uh, Coltrane was in Pittsburgh, Jack L Larson, the weaver, had curated a show out at the center. And he had bought a great deal of African weavings, his collection out there. And so someone told Coltrane about this, and she asked us, would we take him out? So we took him out. So what I'm trying to say is that here's a great jazz musician who wants to see weaving. So, uh, and one thing I, I was trying to tell these students recently, you know, people want to know how I got started. Well, I got started because I wanted to have some sculpture, but the main thing I learned is keep looking and keep reading and keep looking again and uh, see how other people made stuff, you know. And so uh, that was the... Um, what I tried to impart to other people start starting this. And another thing is, you know, if you want to do it, you can. I'm not going to say you're going to start, uh, you know, and end up as Noguchi, but, <laughs> uh, 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 but, but if you want to do it, you, you can. And I always remember Wynton Marcellus saying, well, anyone can Im improvise, you know. I'm not going to say, you're going to improvise greatly, but you can. <laughs> you know, so. That's right. That's right. This is a stunning piece, and it's a great example of something that I think um, is so common in your work of theme and variation that also plays with ideas of music. And I'm just wondering how you sustain, because sometimes you come back to a theme I think we have an example. Here are two works that are where the base has a certain kind of conical form, the top is sort of compact, 
And, um, and maybe you are thinking about them in relation to each other, or maybe not, but they're a few years apart. And I'm just wondering if you can talk about how you return to cer certain ideas in your work and then go forward. Well, sometimes it has to do with the material mm -hmm. because sometimes I get a very large log and I'm pretty fascinated by the circumference or the di diameter of a very large log. I don't really get them that. And sometimes I want to show this, the beauty of the, nat uh, of the natural material. Mm -hmm. And also on some, of course, your eye is going to lead up to the main part of the sculpture, if there's a main uh, part. But as I try to make things where the base it doesn't outshine the top of the sculpture, mm -hmm. so your eye leads up, you look at the uh, sculpture on, on your left, and you'll see the turn and leading up to a very open, open space. In this piece, of course, you can't see, but the, the, the top piece fits over like a head mask, like a shoulder mask. And, and the cherry piece that goes through comes out the other side, which you can't see in a, in, in, in a uh, two-dimensional slide. But um, of course, you know, there's no such thing as infinite cre uh, creation. So you repeat some of the ideas. <laughs> uh, they come up, and a lot of times uh, you've forgotten that you've done this before, uh, <laughs> or you'd like to forget you've done it before. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, but it looks like uh, you can work it another way. and. Um, I remember uh, years ago when Brian Cousy had one of his last shows in Philadelphia, and I drove down there, and people were standing around saying, he does the same thing all the time. And I don't know how they came to that conclusion, being that none of them knew Brian Cousy. You know? That's great. So, um, Discipline is so important to, I mean, I'm in awe of the fact that you go to the studio every day, and uh, we talked a few days before the Memorial Day holiday, and I wish you a good holiday, and you said, every day is a holiday for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. But the reality is that you have worked incredibly hard throughout your life. I mean, for many years, you held a job as a postal worker, and then you made sculpture. So I'm wondering where that discipline comes from and um, that perseverance. Well, I guess a lot of it came from when I was in middle school, they call it junior high school, I was trying to be an All-American at track and basketball. Now, don't laugh, I used to play, but I was captain of junior high school, a ba basketball team. But when I was, going to high, was graduating out of junior high, going to high school, coach at high school looked at me and said, we don't want anyone as short as you. <laughs> but I think that in order to compete against bigger guys, one thing I was always, I trained harder, I was in better shape, and I always thought I could. And I also, I remember, well, those of you who are not nearly as old as, as I, I was, but anyhow, um, when I went into junior high from elementary school, I was a fair student, but when I got coming into high school, they would say, well, we don't expect you colored kids to do as well as so-so. And I started thinking, well, heck. And that propelled me to the honor roll three years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I guess I was lucky I always had confidence in myself regardless of what anyone else said. And I, I, I was fortunate there. But another thing, I didn't have parents that told me that I couldn't do this or, or you're wasting your time at, at this. But um, my sister, I had a sister was a beautiful singer. All my sisters sang and four of them took piano lessons, only two could play. but. 
but, but what I'm trying to uh, illustrate is that they had this opportunity yeah. as where, you know, in many cases, people want to do something and the family said, we can't afford it. Oh, you don't want to do that. Well, see, I never had that obstacle. And I always felt that I could. And um, I ended up playing semi-pro basketball until I was 36. Wow. You know, so, uh, so, so uh, then uh, my cousins all we were all athletic and all pretty strong. So, uh, so, but the main thing is I always felt. That I guess my main model is that I can do it. You know, and, and a lot of times you have a thousand pound log or so. You got to make up your mind that you can do it. <laughs> That's great. I mean, and that um, you in fact. These sort of images from his studio, some of his other work, inspiration board, um, more images from his studio, give you a peek into that world. You taught, among the things you said, I can do it, you taught yourself how to sculpt. You are very, edu I mean, you are very educated, you have a college degree and all that, but you taught yourself how to sculpt. And, um, and I'm wondering if you can, if you remember that beginning, of teaching yourself to sculpt. And then also, I have a picture here of, um, this is one of your works, but you talked about African art and the influence of tribal African art in your work, kind of what you learned in particular from African art. Well, uh, you'll see, I have a tiny living room, at, and, and you can see some of the stuff I've collected over the years. And that's one of the stools, as, People who have studied tribal arts know how important stools are in, in the African tradition. And I don't copy Af African schools. I make all different types. But I was very much influenced by them. And also, uh, I think the main thing that stands out in my work concerning African tribal art is the rhythm of, of these tri tribal arts uh, sculptures. Those who you are really into uh, the uh, statues, I don't hate to call them statues, but sculptures of, of African tribal art, you'll notice in various tribes, the rhythm of, of the figures, uh, or even the mask, and how the God's marks direct your eye and create a different feeling. And that is some of the stuff you'll see how in my work is how the gouge mark direct your eye and, and create a feeling in, in the sculpture. And um, you mentioned also, I'm showing here some of the artists that you mentioned, Brancusi and Noguchi. From, I'm wondering from Noguchi, what did you learn from him? Well, particularly, if you looked at his planner works, particularly the things he did in stone out, out, out of slabs of uh, granite and marble, how, how they were placed and how they played against the planes and the voids mm -hmm. and the pieces, my upright pieces, and even the ones that are slanted, I tried to get do some of that. And, you, and looking at the Brancusi, You'll see some of the feeling in my stools, particularly from, from the Brancusi idea. But the main thing is that what these are about are essence, essence of, of images, just the essence of, of, of the image. And I think that is, to me, the intriguing part. Of course, then the upward movement is something that I'm always striving for. Thank you. And you mentioned teaching, and you've taught at you know, many workshops, but you've never chosen, you've had the opportunity, but you've ne never chosen to teach full-time you know, at no. a college, art school, et cetera. And, um, and yet, you've always said yes, at least many times, to grade schools when they call elementary schools. And I'm wondering if you can talk about why. Well. You know, yeah, schools call me and they want to know how much I want to charge. And not only grade schools, I said, I never charge 
anything for school kids. Uh, simply one thing, you look back at your own background, and one thing I never remember seeing an artist when I was a kid. I didn't know there was anyone that did this beyond maybe cartoons in the movies. And also, I wanted to show these kids, particularly in what people call inner city schools, that they, they can do something because or there is something they would like to do. And I did one over near where my studio is and a, a few years ago, ahead of the pandemic. And, um, and they gave students pencils and papers so they could draw what they saw of, from the uh, slides and stuff. And I was amazed now, most of these children had never seen any type of sculpture, particularly not mine. And I was surprised how adept they were at creating some of the ideas. So um, I, I do this because I think opportunities among uh, people who don't go to museums all the time and they don't, um, the parents aren't really interested in this. They want them to do something they can surely make some money at, and they don't see that this is it, you know. Uh, so that's why I do it. And I have a, a treat. Oh, this is... Um, segment on the show that was called I Want to Be Just Like My Dad. I'd like to uh, uh, that's be just my like my dad. dad. He's wise and he is kind. And he knows just how to help me grow and does his work just fine. I'd like to be just like my dad and have some like me. My dad is, 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 is my hero, really, honestly. I mean, I just have not met anyone as dedicated to what he does and as supportive and loving to his family and um, as dedicated to, 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 to his work. You've created many opportunities for other artists, and um, in addition to young people, and in addition to the opportunities you've created for your own children, who um, it was so moving to to watch. It was, this that episode comes from a longer, of course, a longer episode of Mr. Rogers, but also a longer DVD where um, your son also speaks about your work, and others speak about your work, and. And just the impact that you've had on their lives and the importance of your family is so palpable. And the choices that you've made so that you can sculpt and be there for your family is just, is in itself, that in itself is just incredibly powerful. But you've also created opportunities for other artists. And I'm just wondering, I don't know if you recall this photograph. Uh, this is from 1961, the Re Three Rivers Arts Festival. But maybe if you could, when you're, when, would, as you'd like to talk about um, for instance, the, the Group One, the Watt Lane Club, some of the, some of the other groups that you helped establish, um, and why, yeah. Well, when I lived on Watt Lane, uh, there was a friend of mine, he'd gone to San Francisco, and he was saying, oh, you know what? At parts of San Francisco on the weekend, artists put things on their porches or on lawns, and the, and all over these little streets, you'll see art. So we went around, these houses had upstairs porches and downstairs porches. So we went down this street and we asked her, can we put art on your porch or on your lawn this weekend? And you can take it in Saturday, Saturday night and put it out Sunday morning and we'll pick it up Sunday evening. And everybody just about said, oh yeah, we'll, we'll do that. And so that was the start of Wild Lane Art Club. And then I went to the city and got permission to put art 
in the parks on the weekend. And, and I remember there was a place, a recreational center. They gave us their basketball court, which was a no-no in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and we had the basketball court full of sculpture. And on the chain link fix, we hung paintings all around. And people are saying, are you crazy? People won't, won't want to see this stuff. But you would have been surprised after church is let out and people came from everywhere. And of course, we were Pittsburgh Courier, took pictures of, of, of our groups and so forth. Then we started Group One, which was more a professional group. And a lot of us went into like the Associated Society of Sculptors and things like that. But it gave a lot of young artists a big boost, you know. And I remember uh, we had, it was mainly Afro-Americans. And I remember we were showing out the, in East Liberty. So this young Italian kid came up and said, can I show him? And I, he said, I'm a painter. And I said, well, we have a club. So some people said, oh, he's not in the club. I said, well, you have paintings? He said, yeah. I said, you can show them. And so, and so uh, he always uh, remembers that. He says, that's how I really got interested in, in art. And he really won, went, by the time he was in high school, a scholarship to Paris, you know. So I felt, you know, wow. at least I helped a little. So we recently, only two weeks ago, lost uh, the amazing, sculpt, uh, amazing artist Sam Gilliam, and, uh, who was a very close friend of yours. And I'm wondering what, that, what he inspired in you and what that friendship inspired in you. Well, I think not only Sam, but um, I see Dr. Evans is out there too. So <laughs> he was a, a major, major collector. Uh, but he, we knew how few afro Americans got, got credit for what they did in art, particularly sophisticated stuff. And Sam was one of the most sophisticated artists I know of any stripe. And you see there, he's holding a piece of mine he bought uh, way back. <laughs> and, he, and, and he has it, it's a red, red sandstone. I do stone not much anymore. I can't lift over like I used to, or I used to could lift over 200 pounds, but can't do it now. Maybe 120 is about the best <laughs> I can amazing. do now. But in, anyhow, um, Sam was always an inspiration in the 60s. I think he was an art in America, but we go back to people like Hill Woodruff and people like that. And uh, of course, Sam was also, uh, a good friend of another man I idolized, so I spoke of was Richard Hunt. Right here. And and, uh, and you can and uh, and I think it, uh, the people who have forged a way like Sam has so it influenced so many people and so many art students because he taught in many places, including at graduate uh, graduate students at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, oh, that's a recent piece. Uh, well, not too recent. Uh, uh, 2018 that I did uh, yeah. in, in wood. And I guess Karma has it. I haven't seen it lately. <laughs> <laughs> and this to the right is uh, from an installation of the work of Richard Hunt, who was a contemporary of, of Mr. Mosley, and uh, from an installation at the Art Institute of Chicago um, last year, and he was honored as well at the Art Institute earlier um, in June, um, so just last month. And I have one last artist that you talked with me about when uh, I visited. <laughs> Tell us about him. Well, Ed, Ed Eberly is a, he's not Afro-American, which is not important, but he's a great, great artist in my view, and one of the few people that does what he does, and uh, he works in porcelain. He's from up the river of Natrona, actually, and he went to Carnegie Mellon and he taught, but I think that uh, I'm always uh, known to him trying to get people interested in other artists, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm, a lot of times I, I feel I don't have the best taste because a lot of people don't like what, what I like. But I think that if, if you would happen to go to Ed Everly's studio, I think you'd be amazed at what he does. I find his, uh, uh, but of course, again, he's in Pittsburgh and he, he was in a gallery in New York, but I think they stole most of his work, which was too bad, but that happens. And, uh, but anyhow, he's a dear friend, and I, I'm always talking about uh, anyone that will listen, you should see, when you're in Pittsburgh, you should see Ed Everly's work. My next visit, I'm gonna do that. This is amazing <laughs> work. It's incredible, I had a chance to see some of some of the works that you have at your home, and they're just incredible. Um, I'm wondering, just to close, what's, what's on your mind these days? What's important to you? Well, important is staying healthy like everyone else is trying to. I think we all have, have the same priorities there because of the experience of the last few years. But what's important to me is every morning I get up, I feel good enough to go in and work on something. And then the piece I'm working on now, I've been working on for about a month and a half. I'm hoping another month I'll have it finished. And as you always hope, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> If you're willing uh, to take questions, I'd love to take questions from the uh, audience. Uh, I'm open to anything, yeah. Wonderful. If uh, you uh, wish to ask a question, please uh, just wait for the mics to come in. We're recording this talk, and we want to make sure that they, the audiences beyond today can hear you. So raise your hand. We have a, some big lights in front of us. Don't be shy. Question in the back, and a question right here. Thank you, first of all, thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure. What made you choose walnut as your medium? Well, actually, I didn't choose walnut. I, years ago, I used to get so much wood from the city forestry division. They have a, a, a place where they go in the parks and cut down trees that are falling or decayed or, or collect pe from people who's Lawns are overcrowded and stuff like that. So I used to go out and pick out anything I wanted. But I discovered that a lot of woods, ash and a lot of this stuff wasn't very uh, hard wood. And see, and so I become, I learned about walnut and cherry, hard woods that they make furniture and all that out of. And because the difference is, is that you can make, uh, uh, because of the definition you can make in, in the sculpture, if you look at the uh, uh, slide, you'll see that the, the carving goes different directions, directs your eye different, and, and also has a different rhythm, a different texture, the piece to your, that's attached doesn't have the same texture as the piece on the on the right, the supporting piece. But you can do that with hard woods, you, which you can't do with soft woods. Thank you. Yes. And thank you. Uh, when you're look, you you talked about the diameter and the circumference. Uh, at what point does something speak to you that's inside the log? Well. Uh, no, I, what I do is that I use not just one log, sometimes three or four logs that are assembled. And the, the main thing about wood is if you think about other materials like steel or clay, wood, you, you get a break because you have the natural beauty of the wood. Whereas clay, you just have the clay. You just have, have the steel. But in, in wood, you have, you have the, the natural beauty and also the contrast 
of different woods. So uh, uh, to me, that is the, uh, uh, the main issue. And if I may, a follow-up question. Uh, it was either Miles Davis or Dizzy Gillespie that said, when you hit a wrong note, it's the next note that matters. Well, I'll go farther than that. The Lonely's Monk said there is no wrong notes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but well, the main thing of being a sculptor or a painter or anything is being able, able to uh, uh, in, include and rectify your own mistakes. And when you're doing this stuff, particularly, no one knows if it's right or wrong, you know. It's true, so true. Thank you so much. I have a much. question here. Oh. Thank, thank oh. you so much for this very, very rich conversation. And Mr. Mosley, it's extraordinarily inspiring and exciting to hear about the broad range of your interests. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the moments or moments at which you began to focus your time specifically on sculpture, um, hearing about your interest in basketball and music. What was the moment at which you began to really decide to dedicate yourself to the visual arts and making sculpture? Well, like Thank a you. lot of people back then, I had like two and a half jobs. <laughs> I, 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 I worked for the Pittsburgh Courier as a sports writer. And I got, I was employed by the post office, but I still kept writing my column. But me, before I went in the post office, I was a darkroom technician. Those of you who were young enough might remember dark rooms. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I used to enlarge photographs, not only for, 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 for the photo guild, but even for other artists, other photographers. And so I remember when I went to tell the, the sports editor, Bill Nunn, at the Courier that I was, I had, I had to quit the Courier because I wanted to spend more time trying to do sculpture. And that, that was, I guess, in the middle 50s. So the pictures from the, even before that, before the Three Rivers, I've done some things. So in, in the mid 50s, I decided that that's what I would do. But no matter what I did, I always made time. I usually try to car five hours a day, no matter what. But then after, you know, of course, but, but after I quit the other job, I, I and then I had uh, three children that lived with me, and I had a routine, strict routine. You know, um, children were a lot more disciplined then than they seem to be now. At least <laughs> uh, parents seem to have more, at least I did. If I told my children to do something, they did it. I mean, there was no arguing about it or, or anything like that. And that's the way I was brought up. So I had a pattern. Uh, at three o'clock, from three o'clock to seven o'clock, uh, there was ho dinner and homework. After that, in bed at 10 o'clock. So you had about three hours after, de all depending. I remember one time my youngest son came home and at five o'clock after dinner, he's rushing out the door. I said, where are you going? I don't have any homework. I said, oh, yes, you do. You got, you got a C in the last report card in English. You have homework in English till next report card. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it was, but, but, and then from five to 10, I would go in the studio. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, I'd work 10 to 12 hours to make up for the time I couldn't do it during the week. And in my old age, I'm, I'll be 96 in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I, you know, I, 
uh, I still work six hours a day sometimes, and if I really get excited, I'm nearing the finish line, sometimes I do eight or nine hours when I'm so, I'm so eager to see this piece come together. And uh, sometimes I'm not as happy, but you know, you gotta be pretty happy that when you're an old person, you still have some uh, physicality. And I, I, I remember a lot of times when I was someplace, people offered me a seat because I know, I know I'm old. I said, no, I'm used to standing six, seven hours a day, you know. <laughs> that comes from the uh, benefit of, of my teenage years trying to be an All-American, you know. I think we had a question over here. I think you, you probably answered this question from, from you probably answered Anne's uh, uh, question in a way that would, would answer mine, but uh, one of the things that's notable about Pittsfield, about, uh, about Pittsburgh, is that people leave in the art world. Frickin' Mellon left, and Andy Warhol left, but you, you stayed. And uh, if you could follow on from, uh, from what Anne was, uh, the, the answer to Anne's question, uh, was it just because you were a little bit older? Or was there an, a lively arts community in Pittsburgh that we didn't? Don't know well, I, uh, uh, first thing was I had children. I had th three. In 1968, I had my first show at the Carnegie, and two dealers, Art Seidenberg and Lefebvre, offered me possibilities in New York. I had to quit my job and that sort of stuff. And I said, well, no, because I can tell you, uh, my mother and father broke up when I was eight years old, and times became really turbulent for our family after that, the children particularly. And I always promised myself. Now, I had that I've had other opportunities, even when I worked in the post office, I took uh, the federal writing tests, and I could have gone to Washington, but. There was no, and I know my ex-wife had the kids. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not taking that job. I didn't take any job that took me away from seeing how the kids were gonna turn out. Now, I've been fortunate enough, I had, my, I had two wives, each of them had three children, and I, they all have graduated from somebody's school. You know. <laughs> It's important. So the, the idea is that I wanted, to, that, that was first. Another thing was, is that art, in, in my view, you know, like going to New York or going, when Andy Warhol left, they left right out of college because I'm trying to think, um, the guy that did the nudes with the rocking chairs and all, was Andy's, his uh, uh, he was a good friend of Andy, Pearlstein. Well, they, 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 all, they went to New York right, right away. I think Pearl, Pearlstein was there working already, and, and so Andy went there and started doing advertising. And of course, the idea was, I guess, Maybe if I were young and single, I'd have flown too, but <laughs> I, I, I had other priorities. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, you know, like not only is, is New York the Mecca, uh, just about for everything, everybody that, I, I always remember, is a piano player, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, yeah when I received the Governor's Award, uh, he, he, he received one too, and he was saying, he was telling Desi Gillespie he was moving back to Philadelphia. He said, Desi Gillespie said, man, I tried like hell to get out of Philadelphia. <laughs> Why are you going back there? But, uh, but also, the way things stand, the way things turned out is that, um, 
other galleries got interested in me, particularly doing the international. And I like the people that I'm with now. And uh, and also, I, I I remember Sam and I were great buddies. I used to go down to D.C. a lot back in in the day. And he stayed in D.C. because his children were there, and he showed in New York. So. I think, again, I think you have to decide what you really want to do. And I don't think a selfish attitude wouldn't, it's just not what I, I am about, you know. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm, we have so many more questions for you, but I think that that statement just sums up the inc incredible integrity of your work, the beauty of your practice. And um, I just want to thank you for sharing your stories, for sharing your art with us, and being here in Maine. Um, and to make an argument that, as you said earlier, talent is plentiful, <laughs> and talent is everywhere, and creativity is everywhere. So I think there isn't one place where art happens. And I thank you for reminding us of that um, by staying in Pittsburgh for the reasons that you gave us, that it, there's art everywhere, and artists that should be looked at everywhere. Thank well, you. Well, thank you. <laughs>